Let's put our hands together and praise our God today. All right, so good to see all of you here. Those of you who are joining us for the first time, thank you very much for joining us today. I do hope and pray that God would speak to you today and uh, your time here would be worthwhile. Uh, my name is Chaitanya, just in case you need to know my name. I pastor this church. The one who came before this is my wife, Janet. She also pastors along with me here in this church, so uh, we are here to serve you. Um, we'd love for you to keep coming back to us here at this church, and um, that we, we pray for you, even though, even though we don't know your names, um, uh, we don't know when you're going to show up, but we always pray in hope that you're going to show up in the church, and that God would speak to you on that day, and we get the joy of being um, fellowshipping together with you here in this church. So um, I want you to know that we are praying for you already in faith that you're going to come to the church, all right? Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. We are in the middle of a series called uh, Win the Day. Um, the idea is very simple. Because yesterday is already gone, it's history. And tomorrow is not yet come, and we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. It's mystery. So um, there's no point thinking about history or mystery. What we have is the day that we have today in our hands. Our job is to win this day. That's why, uh, you know, Bible continuously, all through the scriptures, talk about this day. In fact, even to praise him, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Right from the book of Genesis, right from the beginning to the end to the revelation, God challenged us to keep our focus on today. Because today is the only day that matters. If we don't win today, we would keep losing every day. So our goal was to help you to understand this, that if you can learn to win the day, that means almost anybody can accomplish anything if they, if they work at it long enough, hard enough, and smart enough. And for that, obviously, you need to win each day at a time. In order to win each day, uh, we talked about seven habits that we can develop, seven, seven days in a week, right? So seven habits... Um, that we can develop, uh, we need to develop in order to keep winning the day. And we started off with day one, uh, we talked about flip the script. Flip the script simply means this, that you need to change the way you narrate your story. No matter what happened in your past, you got to learn to look at your life from the eyes of God. If you want to change your life, you got to change your story. The way you tell your story matters a lot. The second week we talked about Kiss the way. It's, uh, we took words out of the mouth of Charles Spurgeon when he said, if the, if the wave that is throwing you into chaos is actually throwing you against the rock of ages, you might as well kiss the wave because that wave is sending you to the rock of ages. Even though wave may right now be like an obstacle, obstacle itself is not your enemy. It is in fact the way because it is sending you to the master who can help you to overcome the obstacles. So kiss the wave. So don't look at your problems and worry about them. In fact, the problems are good because they are the ones who are sending you to the master himself. Kiss the wave. Then we talked about eat the frog. We took the words of Mark Twain and we applied that. If, if, uh, if you have a list of things to do in a day and one of them is eating a frog, Begin your day by eating the frog. Because once the hardest thing is finished, the rest of the day becomes easier to handle. Right? How many of us enjoy eating the frog? Yeah, I mean, obviously. So eat the frog first before you do the rest of the job because the rest of the day would look like a breeze for us. But if we keep postponing eating the frog, you will, at the end of the day, you still need to eat the frog. And that never gets done. So the idea is this. If you want God to do the super, then you got to do the natural. Unless you do the natural, God cannot add super to it, thus making it supernatural. All right? So eat the frog. Then last week, we talked about fly the kite. We took that title from a, story, from a um, uh, you know, incident in history um, and talked about how um, small things matter. Because how you do 
anything is how you do everything. Sometimes we ignore small things because we are trying to prepare for big things. The problem is you'll never get the big things if you ignore the small things. How you do anything here is how you do everything. So we talked about how we need to give our best in obscurity. When nobody's watching us, when nobody's appreciating us, when nobody's paying attention to us, that's when you give your best. Because that's how God can bless back doubly. Give your best in obscurity and God will reward you doubly. He'll give you double portion. Uh, number two, the second thing that we learned in order to fly the kite, we need to do little things like they're big things. Then God will do big things like they're little things. Because we ignore little things, focusing on big things, big things become bigger things and big, bigger problems to us. If we do little things as if they're big things, then God does big things like they're small things. Then we talked about how it is important for us to complete the task that God gave us responsibly, then God can respond back extravagantly. Your job may be small. Your job may not be something that makes the whole world change. You may think like that. But whatever your job is, at this point of your life, you do it responsibly. It, you do it fully. You complete your task. Even though nobody's going to appreciate it, even though you may feel like there's no result that's coming out of this, you will still do it because it's your responsibility. As, as a husband, as a father, as a wife, as a mother, as a brother, as a sister, as an employer and an employee, whatever job you have, as a student, what you need to do now, you do it now. Even if you think it doesn't really matter. Then God can respond back extravagantly. That's what we talked about. Today, we're going to talk about cut the rope. Now, most of us, I believe, are way more educated, way more um, informed than that is good for us. Unfortunately, we live in an age where everybody knows everything and everybody thinks that they know everything and everybody thinks that they don't need to know anything anymore. Which is true, absolutely. I know all of you know everything. In fact, most of what I taught over the last five weeks, you probably are sitting there and thinking, I already know this. What's the big deal about this? Which is absolutely right, I know. You have far more information than me. You know far more than what I'm trying to tell you. Unfortunately, as most Christians know most things, what they are bad at is doing them. You may have the knowledge. You may have the information. What you need is obedience, which all of us lack. So today, my goal is to push you to obey God. Push you to do that one thing that you are not willing to do. Because that one thing can change your life. Just like how the one thing that these three kids did today is going to change their life. They don't know it right now. But their lives are going to change from this moment on. That God is actually changing everything, arranging, rearranging, simply based on this one single decision that they made to follow Jesus. Because now they declared they belong to Jesus. Which means God is going to say, I own them. Nobody else gets to lay their hands on them anymore. It's like God declares to the whole world, the whole spiritual, physical, every realm that is there. To them, these kids belong to me now. My mark is on them. Nobody gets to touch them anymore. One decision away from a total renovation of your life. It could be possible that some of you are just one decision away. So I'm trying to push you to do that today. That's my goal. That's what cutting the rope is all about. Because what you may be hesitating to do could be the one thing that can change your life. In 1853... America hosted world's first world, World's Fair in New York City. It was a beautiful exhibition conducted in what they call the Crystal Palace, where they have invited inventors from all across the world, 
products to be displayed for investors to either invest in or for the you know, a marketplace to buy them and sell them. You know, that's the idea. In that place, latest and greatest inventions were exhibited, showcased. It was also the place where a man by the name of Elisha Otis wanted to do something that would define his entire life's trajectory from that moment. You see, Elisha Otis invented what he called elevator brakes. Until that point, the elevators were done if there was a lifting process was happening. It was by rope, you remember? You get into, you, well, obviously you don't remember that. You don't even know that. <laughs> so you get into the elevator at that time, whatever that is called lifting, they would hold the rope and they'd pull themselves up. And the same way, you have to pull yourself down with a pulley on the top. That's the only way to do. There's no other way. But Elisha Otis invented what he called an elevator break, which would make it possible for the elevator to stop in the middle and hang there. But the problem is, people were not trying to buy it. Nobody wants to buy that. Elisha uh, Otis, no matter how much he tried to market it, nobody is willing to buy Who would want to do that? Who would want to experiment on that? So nobody bought it. Now he had to sell that. He knew his invention would work. So what he did is he built an elevator in that great crystal palace. About 23 feet high. Actually 32 feet high, I think. From the top. He went and stood on the top of that elevator. Called for the attention of all the people who are in the exhibition. Call them. And uh, now suddenly as they see a man perked up on the top of an elevator, they obviously were curious and there's a hushed silence and everybody's watching and listening. Once they paid their attention to him, then he in turn looked up and called out to a man who was standing on the top with an ax in his hand. Now you know elevators are hung by the ropes, right? So he shouted out to him, cut the rope. The moment he said, cut the rope, the guy on the top cut the rope. And to the horror of all the people who are watching, the elevator started falling down and then stopped miraculously. Everybody in that exhibition saw what Elisha Otis's elevator break can do. It was a risk for him to do that. Even though he is the inventor of it, at that height, he doesn't know whether it would stop. He hopes his machine would work. He believed his machine would work. So he made a life-defining decision. I'm going to do this in front of the whole world. If I die, I die. But if I live, I got a business. And so Otis still sells elevators, even after nearly two centuries. One act of cutting the rope changed his life. Here is the beauty of it. That time when he did that, 1853, when he cut the rope, and in the entire New York City, the tallest building at that point of time was five stories old. Height, sorry. Five stories height. Because obviously nobody wants to climb up beyond five stairs. We'd be dead. Oh, well, at least all of us, normal people. Nobody wanted to build any building beyond that, any height beyond that. But what Elisha Otis's invention made possible was, from that moment, people began to believe, okay, if there is a possibility of elevators stopping in multi-stories, then can we go up than five stories? And so they began. They began. In 50 years, there were 538 skyscrapers in New York City. Within one century, 58,000 skyscrapers that are beyond 50 floors were built all across New York State. One act of Elisha Otis's cutting the rope made skyscrapers possible. If there was no Elisha Otis, if there was no cutting the rope, 
There are no skyscrapers today. Do you see what happened? One risk, one calculated risk, one defining decision changed the whole world. What if Elisha Otis did not believe in his own product? What if he thought, I know I made it, I'm not really sure it would work or not, and he did not try that on that day? I can't imagine a world without skyscrapers. See, that's my point. You're one decision away from a total renovation of your life. One decision away. What happened in Joshua chapter 2 is a very familiar incident for all of us. I'm going to take four historical narratives and teach something out of this on cutting the rope. So I'll begin with this, this particular incident that took place in John, Joshua chapter 2. We'll come back to that as we close also. This entire chapter is about a narrative of a woman by the, who goes by the name of Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute into whose home two Hebrew spies came. These Hebrew spies, not the spies, huh? the spies. The Hebrew, these Hebrew spies um, were scouting the land of Jericho because they want to go and fight against it. When they came, she hosted them. And just like how, you know, sometimes small things can be... Um, Quickly, the news can go out. The same news went out to the king of Jericho, who came to know that two spies from Hebrew spies came to scout the land. So he sent out his soldiers to find them. They came, they knocked on the door of Rahab. Rahab um, hid both of them, telling them that they are not here anymore. Now that thing, that particular thing, that one single act of telling them they are not here while hiding them inside her home, is cutting the rope for her. It, it changes. From that moment, our life changes from that moment. Everything about her would change because she is lying to her own people about two Hebrew spies, about our enemies, while hiding them inside our home, <laughs> saying, I don't have those, them. those guys have already left in the morning. Now here is the point. If they come to know that there are two guys, that the guys are still hiding there, she and her entire life is in trouble. Her entire family is in trouble. And all of them are going to be put to death, obviously on the charges of treason. Somehow she escapes them. These two guys, from whom she probably is expecting a protection, which she obviously expresses later on, saying that when you guys come and fight against us, spare me and my family and my family's families. Can you just spare us? Because we heard about you. You guys are strong. You guys are, your God is with you. Uh, apparently, your God is helping you to win all the wars. So we know that you're going to win against us. If you do that, when you do that, please spare our family. That was a request to, do, to, to two of them. Now, here is the problem. There is a risk element there. The thing is, the two guys can say no, can say yes and still kill them. Even if they say and they want to protect, Joshua could say no, God told me to destroy everybody, destroy them. Anything can happen. So the risk is both ways. It's not the risk of Jer Jerichoites killing them. It's also the risk of enemies whom she is saving they also can kill her. But she cut the rope. Literally cut the rope. That day, Rahab. We often don't do that with our lives. Some of us probably are postponing a lot of things that we know we must do. We know that those are right things to do. We know we can sense that God is asking us to do. But still we keep postponing them. We keep you know, turning our eyes away from them. We keep being indecisive and not taking that step, not show obedience to our God. 
if you only can believe and take that one step of faith. I'm not asking you uh, to jump off, take a blind leap of faith. That's not what I'm asking you to do. I am asking you to keep your both eyes uh, uh, wide open. I am asking you to keep your eyes on Jesus and then get out of the boat. I'll come to this a little later. If you focus on wind and waves, you're always going to stay inside the boat. But if you focus on Jesus, you will get out of the boat. Or at least there is a chance for you to get out of the boat. See, the only way to walk on the water is to keep your eyes on Jesus. Right? The moment Peter took his eyes off, we'll come to Peter a little later. The moment he took his eyes off from Jesus, he began to drown. The only way to walk on the water is to keep your eyes, on, eyes fixed on Jesus. But of course, you also, get out of, you also have to get out of the boat. But we don't do that. Most of us hesitate to do that. Here is the point. Our greatest regrets at the end of our lives won't be the mistakes we have made. Many of us make a lot of mistakes every single day. But they, those are not the things that we'd be regretting. Our greatest regrets at the end of our lives would be the moments we missed because we're too busy or too lazy. Or the opportunities we left on the table because we are too scared or too distracted. Or there'll be the possibilities we lost because we are too rigid are too gullible. I want to call them with names. I want to call them sin of procrastination, sin of omission, and sin of presumption. Sin of procrastination. You postpone things. You postpone your decisions. You postpone your obedience. Even though you know it is the right thing to do, you know that you have to do, but you postpone them because either you are too busy or too lazy. Being too busy or being too lazy will cause you to procrastinate everything in life. It's a sin. Or because you are too scared or too distracted. Too many things occupy your mind. Too many things you're trying to keep your eyes on. Or you're getting scared, too scared. Looking at the winds and waves. And because of that, you are not stepping out of the boat. Most of us don't make decisions based on what we want to call possibility thinking. Because we think this may happen, we don't take those decisions. We don't take those steps. How come only Peter got out of the boat? Why not the other 11? Because their, possi their possibility thinking says, if I get out of the boat, I will drown. That's their possibility thinking. But Peter's possibility thinking is, if I can see Jesus and Jesus says, come, then there is a possibility of me walking on the water. Because there is a possibility of me drowning. But there is also a possibility of me walking on the water. Because we are constrained by that kind of mindset, we don't do certain things, don't do the right things. That's called sin of omission. Or some of us are too rigid. We don't want to. We, we're inflexible in our thinking. You know? we, we don't even want to imagine anything. We're just too happy with what is happening right now. So we, either that, or because we are too gullible. But everything, every person, every news, every circumstantial change, everything scares us. Everything pulls us back from making those decisions, taking those steps. It's a sin of presumption. You're assuming something would happen tomorrow. In that assumption, you are also becoming presumptuous about God. Do you know that? When you assume worse will happen to you tomorrow, you are thinking that God is not going to be good to me. That's a dangerous sin. 
you're questioning the character of God, you're pulling away yourself from who God really is. When you, especially as a Christian, when you believe in Jesus and you don't take the risk, then you are questioning the power of God itself. There you go. Rahab, by doing what she did, overcame them. We'll, we'll circle back to Rahab towards the end. Oh, what a, what, an, what a decision that she made as she opened the door. She made a decision. As she opened the door, she took a risk. Cut the rope. That's it. From that moment, her life could go anyway. There are times when you need to do that. Today could be that day. For them, this was the day. For some of you, you are trying to push your baptism back and back and back. This is the day. For some of you who know that you need to come to Jesus Christ, that you need to accept Jesus as your personal savior, and you've been pushing it back. And I'll come to that a little more later. This is the day. This is the day. This probably is your last chance. If you don't cut the rope today, you may never get a chance again. You see, you may be playing it safe, but playing it safe is risky. That's the point of this sermon today. That's a big idea. Take it back. Don't play safe. Because playing it safe is the risky part. So how do you then stop playing safe and cut the rope? What does it actually mean to cut the rope? And that's what I'm trying to answer in three simple statements. Number one, cutting the rope is to resolve to make a defining decision. Cutting the rope is to make a defining decision with your life. I just told you, right? These three made a life-defining choice today. Three more did the life-defining choice in the first service. Six of them today made a life-defining choice. It is going to change the trajectory of their life from now. There are times when those decisions that you need to make may not make sense to you. Sometimes, some things that God asks us to do doesn't make sense to us. And the point is this, it doesn't always have to make sense. For me to say that would be easier. And you would be sitting there and thinking, for you to say that is easy. You don't know my life. I know. But you also don't know my life. So there are decisions that you do need to make that doesn't make any sense. Because God is asking you to do. When God calls us to do something, it doesn't always have, doesn't always make sense, doesn't always add up. As a matter of time, there will be times it takes more faith than you have to muster it up in order to take those steps, those decisions. Some of you are saying, I want to take this decision, I don't have faith enough. Because it is risky, actually risky for me to make this decision. Imagine, I know so, uh, most of them, the guys who came, um, uh, took baptism today, well, at least four of them came from a good, solid Christian home whose parents have a legacy. Well, there are obviously, there are people who come from a different cultural background. I've, 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 I, I mean, I grew up as a Christian all my life, so obviously I wouldn't know what does it actually mean to come from a different culture and follow Jesus. All your life, you follow certain things, you're doing certain things, you are brought up to think certain ways, you're brought up to make certain kinds of decisions in certain ways. And then suddenly, one day you make this decision, you are grappling with this a situation where you know you have to make this, you know it is the right decision, but making the decision is more dangerous for you than not making it. 
If you make the decision, you have a possibility of being ostracized by your family. It could be possible the day you come out and say, I'm a Christian. Now your family may not immediately throw you out, but you know that moment will set you off um, to, 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 in a direction where you are getting cut off slowly from the very people you grew up with, people you love, people you cherish, you had fun with. They're not bad people. They're people you love, you want to be with them. You want your children to grow around them. Now, as a Christian who grew up in a Christian home, I'll never be able to understand that. That feeling that you, some of you, will go through. It's impossible for me to comprehend what you probably would be feeling when you have to make that choice. But here is the point. It is that choice that will define the rest of your life. Defining decisions. It is whether accepting Jesus into your personal life, even if it is um, going to be risky. It is following Jesus Christ publicly by taking baptism in the water, knowing that this is going to cause a lot more trouble than what you already have. You still do that because that's the right thing to do. That's the one thing that is going to create a new direction that God wants to create for you. Now, I know Abraham's story we would have heard a thousand times. And there are a lot of things that we remember in Abraham's life story. Some of our most cherished passages in the journey of Abraham's um, life and, and the conversations with God are, are, come from chapter 12, chapter 17, chapter 20, where God gave promises after promises. Uh, chapter 15, you'd see how God continuously told Abraham, come follow me, I'll bless you, I'll make you a nation, I'll give you so many children that you will not be able to count them. In fact, many nations will come out of you, you will be a blessing to many nations, those nations would be a blessing to other nations, and all those blessings that are multiplying, you know, those words that, we love those passages because we want to apply them to ourselves, right? When you come to chapter 17, uh, and if you read Genesis chapter 17, it can be divided into three parts. The first half, God is speaking to Abraham and to, uh, reiterating his promises. He already did that in chapter 12 and chapter 15 of Genesis. Now he's reiterating them. Listen, you forgot? Let me remind you what I promised. This is how you, your life is going to look like. This is how your future is going to look like. This is what I want to do with you. This is what I, I, I'm going to do with your children. All those blessings he's talking and then Abraham's thinking, what he's thinking, his wife basically blurted it out. <laughs> That's funny. You're too old to have a child. First of all, in order for us to experience all those blessings, we need to have a child. Even if we want to have a child, we don't have. At this point of time, you promised us long back, 25 years ago, we set off in this journey. This was 25 years ago promise, huh? When he was 75 years old, God promised, I'll give you a child, leave everything and come follow me. Now he's 99 years old. And God has not yet given the child. So, no wonder Sarah smiled. And thought, this is too late. And then God, that's the second half of that passage, where God speaks to her and says, no, by this time next year, you'll have a child in your hand. But something happened in the third part which we don't actually pay attention to. It was that third part in chapter 17 that made everything else possible in the next. That day, when God gave him the promise, he said, Abraham, I want you to circumcise yourself. Every male child in your family not just in your family, in your servants, among your servants, anybody who's going to live with you, circumcise them. Now circumcision, at that point of time when God is requiring of Abraham, is an act of consecration. Where you're consecrating and setting yourself separately, 
by getting circumcised, you're saying, I am now a child of Yahweh. I'm the people of Yahweh. That's the point, right? Consecration. You're consecrating yourself. What they did as a circumcision, we are now doing it as an act of water baptism. Remember that. The baptism in the water itself does not save us. But it is an act where you are consecrating yourself and saying, I belong to God now. Do you, do you understand? That's the act. But you already believe. Abraham already believes in God. Abraham is already a child of God. But God says, the way to show the whole world that you belong to me is to go through circumcision. Now here is the point. It's the verses 26 you all need to underline. It says, that very night, Abraham circumcised. Now that sounds like a little bit of information, right? Okay, that's... A, no, 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 but you've got to pause there. Put yourself in Abraham's shoes. He's 99 years old. And God tells him, I want you to circumcise. And he had 100 excuses he can give. God, I have sugar. Anything I do, I'm gone. Please, don't ask me to do now. I'm too old for this. Maybe when I was younger, I probably would have done this. If you want, I can do it for my children, all these little kids, not me. Or he could have said, okay, God, let me prepare for this. This is a big moment in my life. I want to have five days of fasting and prayer, and I will decide about this. Some of us live our lives like that. Asking God for extra one day and then five days and then 15 more years. Somebody did like that. His life became worse than what it was 15 years before. A guy called Hezekiah, whom God is saying, come home. This fellow is begging God, please. I want to stay here. Give me some more time. God is saying, you've, you've lived a great life. I want you to come home with me. But he begged God to give him 15 more years. 15 years later, his life. He had a great testimony up to that point when God is asking him to come home. That moment when God extended it because he asked for it, he started falling down. Sometimes asking God for an extension will lead us there. When God says, come home, better go home. That's a good way to go. Sorry to talk about death, but that's the point is that. When he asks you to do, do it that day. He did that that day. He could have said, you see, the problem is this. You can look at the circumcision and say, that's hard. You see, hard decisions get harder. They don't get easier. You may say, five days from now, I'll, I'll think about this. But five days from now, it will become more harder for you to take that decision. See, if you, what you don't do today, you're less likely to do it tomorrow. If you don't do it today, your heart becomes a little harder. Now, here's the problem. When your heart becomes harder, your hearing also becomes difficult. Before you know it, it will become very difficult for you to discern the difference between the voice of the Holy Spirit and the voice of the world. And you will begin to struggle with what is the will of God for my life? What should I do right now? Should I make this career change or not? Should I buy this house or not? Should I move from this location to another location or not? You are struggling with the decision making because something happened to your hearing. Because something happened to your heart. That happened because the first day when God told you, get circumcised, you didn't. The harder your heart becomes, the harder it becomes, it'll be, it'll be for you to hear the voice of God. That's why Jesus says, I mean, Jesus did not even mince words huh, when he spoke in John chapter 8. 
He says, fellows, you can't hear me because you don't belong to me. If any one of us is struggling, what is the will of God for my life? You stop listening to him. And you're finding it increasingly difficult to know what is coming from God or not, which means you are not in relationship with him. John chapter 8, verses 47, he says, those who are not in the fellowship with the Father cannot hear the voice of the Father. But they can hear the voice of Satan. You know, the previous verses he says, you are able to hear the voice of the Father of lies because you belong to him. So if you, you know, get circumcised. Do it today. Um, because God wants us to get where he wants us to go more than we want to get there. And he's awfully good, in, good at getting us there. All Abraham had to do was circumcise himself that very day. Within a year, he had a child in his hand. Just as God promised. Your miracle is just one decision away from you. One decision away. All those promises that God made would not have been possible if Abraham did not make a life-defining decision of getting consecrated. You see what I'm trying to tell you? Because you're postponing this decision, God has to wait for you to make that decision. He wants to bless you. He wants to fulfill the promises he made to you. He is capable of fulfilling those promises. But unfortunately, you are not giving him a choice. So, cutting the rope is making life-defining decisions. Number two, cutting the rope is choosing to take calculated risks. Calculated risks. When I say calculated, I'm simply saying risk and reward ratio. You're looking at that. When Peter stepped out of the boat, we always talk about Peter stepping out of the boat. But you do need to rewind back to Matthew chapter 14 and see what is happening there. Jesus is walking on the water and he's coming because of the wind and the stormy conditions that they were in. They got scared. They thought it was a ghost. So they called out and said, is it a ghost? Jesus says, don't worry. I am, it is me, Jesus. And Peter immediately stands up and says, can I jump into the water? Did he jump into the water? Before he did, he did something else. He said, Jesus, if it's you, do I have the permission to walk on the water? He asked Jesus first. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's called calculated risk. The risk is still there. The risk is he can still drown. But he took the permission from the master. So can I do this? And Jesus says, yes. And Peter gets out onto the water, out of the boat, onto the water. So here is the point. Before you take any risk, pray first. Pray and ask God for permission. How do I know what is the right risk to take? Anything that is God honoring, God glorifying, God will give permission for you to do it. Anything that is self-centered, self-motivated, selfish, has a selfish gain in your mind, must be checked. Does that make sense? So, Peter stepped out of the boat. He knew the laws of nature. He knows that nobody can walk on the water. Yet, after he asked Jesus, and when Jesus said, come out, he trusted Jesus enough to get out of the boat. You see, if Jesus was already at the boat, standing beside the boat and saying, Peter, come, come out, I'll hold your hand, it would have been easier. In fact, I think all the 11 of them would have done that. Well, 12 of them would have done that. But Jesus was far away still. It needs a lot more faith to believe in Jesus when he's far away. 
to get out of the boat. But he did. But he did it after he took permission. I think prayer is the way we set our goals and run, uh, move towards it. Here is the point. Prayer is the way we write history before it happens. Peter is the only guy in human history who is a human who walked on the water. We wrote history, but prayed first. Even though he was scared, in fact, he even sank as Jesus picked him up. Did Jesus pick him up and threw him directly into the boat? You're only seeing Jesus, Peter walking towards Jesus. You got to see G Peter walk, walking back with Jesus into the boat. Wait a second, let me paint this for you. You're not able to understand this part. Why risk is good? Especially calculated risk is good. When Peter stood up and said, Jesus, can I come? <coughs> and Jesus said, yeah, come. Everybody else in the boat would have said, that's crazy. Just like how our you know, friends would tell us, it's crazy, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Well-meaning friends would tell us, don't do that, don't do that, it's risky. Why are you trying to do this? And Peter had to get out of the boat. As he listened to those voices, I'm definitely sure it started playing on his head too. It sounded nice when he said, Jesus, can I walk on the water? But now that he's listening to everybody else, and he's also looking at the water, and he has to now take the step. He must be thinking, this is crazy, this is crazy, this is crazy, this is crazy. This is awesome, this is awesome, this is awesome. As he's walking on the water. You see, it is this is crazy movement that leads to this is awesome movement. But you want only this is awesome movement. Without taking a risk, you can't. Does it make sense? I told you, you're one decision away from a total renovation of your life. If we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, we can have the faith to step out of the boat, cut the ropes, take those risks. That seems to go against every law of nature. That's probably why James says, listen, James' words may sound a little harsh when he says this, but he's telling the truth in love. James chapter 4, verse 17, he says, listen, whoever knows what is right, right thing to do, and does not do it, is committing sin. That's sad, huh? That's called sin of omission, by the way. He's saying, you know what is right to do. You know the right thing to do. And yet you are not doing it. It's a sin in the sight of God. Number three. Cutting the rope means dare to offer selfless sacrifice. Dare to offer selfless sacrifices. Listen to that very carefully. I didn't say sacrifices. I said selfless sacrifices. Most of us, when we give sacrifices, we expect something back. Right after this series, we're going to do a new series called Tabernacle. And we want to paint a picture of how Old Testament Tabernacle would look like, what does it actually mean to us, and how it shows Christ to us. We want to take you through that journey, and this, this place is going to be amazing during that season. Don't miss that. While preparing for that, I was reading through the book of Leviticus and I realized that there are so many offerings you have to make in order even to get a good, good job from God. I mean, you, nobody would even go near, near to the tent, even the outer tent. Couldn't go. None of us were eligible to go there also. In spite of giving so many sacrifices. Most of us give our offerings out of guilt or out of an expectancy. I'm giving, 
God will give me back. That's how we give. I'm not talking about that giving. I'm talking about selfless sacrifices. For some of you, you need to make a life-defining decision. For some of you, you need to make a calculated risk. For some of you, you need to give away what you know you should be giving away. A selfless sacrifice. We have heard about this widow for many times. You find her in 1 Kings chapter 17. She's called the widow of Zarephath. Now, any time, any place, when we are talking about offering, we'll talk about the widow of Zarephath. I, I, I kind of feel we hear only half story and, and don't get the full picture of what happened there. Chapter 17 is very important for us to read. Chapter, 1 Kings chapter 17. The entire story must be read and must be read in details. Elijah was in a cave being fed by raven. God is feeding him every day, sending a raven to get food to him and during the famine period. One day, the brook finished. I mean, the, the brook where he was getting water, that dried up. And so God told him, listen, I have spoken to a woman, a widow in Zarephath to provide you with food. Go to her home. So Elijah gets up from the cave, goes to Zarephath. Find this woman who is on outside on the field, carrying, you know, trying to find some twigs and sticks in order to cook a meal. So he goes to her and he says, can I, can I have some water? She invites him to her home. She gives him the water. As he drinks the water, he looks at her and says, can I have some food? Bread? She says, I got no bread. I got some flour and some oil with which I'm going to cook right now. And that's the last thing that we have. And we were going to feed ourselves, especially my son, and then die. Wait a second. But I thought God already spoken to her. You remember that? God is speaking to Elijah and told him what? Elijah, I've spoken to a woman in Zarephath to feed you. Go there, she'll feed you. But what is she saying? I can't feed you. I got only flour and oil. There's no mention of God in between, right? I'm, 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 I mean, the, the passage was there, always. And I, I, I'm, I'm thinking, how come I miss this? God already spoke to the woman. That means she knew a man of God will come and she has to feed him. But she's thinking, I want to. If I am the widow of Zarephath, this is what I'm thinking. I want to. He's a man of God, I want to honor him. But I don't have. I got little. I want to do God, but I got little. The problem is this is so little that if we eat one time, we all die after this. This is, I need this. I know you're asking me, God, I need this. Maybe if I tell the man of God, he'll understand and he will say, it's okay. But the problem was the man of God looks at her and says, it's okay. Cook it and bring it to me. And you will have enough. Now, do you see what I'm saying? She, need, she knows she needs to do this. But she also doesn't want to do it. Not because she's a selfish person. Not because she has less faith. Not because she doesn't be believe in God and does not love God or does not respect the man of God. She just knows it's not enough. You understand what I'm trying to tell you right now? No. Think about her. She's actually saying to herself, this is so little. I want to feed my son. At least he gets to live a little longer than me. If I'm a mother, I'm a, I'm a parent, so I'm, I know what I'm talking about right now. And if that is the last morsel that I got, I would say I'll feed my child. At least my child lives longer than me. And I die before they die. I know for sure he's going to die anyway. Hold that thought, okay? I'll come back to that later. It's a very important thought for you to remember. But she's, she's right when she's saying, I can't give. But then she decides to believe. And says, okay. 
I'm going to this, do this sacrifice. Selflessly, she went and cooked, brought the food to Elijah. One act of selfless sacrifice. Bible says, from that day, till the day the famine ended, they had enough to eat. Enough to eat. Not more. Listen, not more. Not overflowing. Enough. The same morsel of flour and pint of oil. That's it. Nothing else. Nothing more. What she thought was the last thing remained with her always till the end of famine. She was cooking every single day from the same thing. And she was feeding herself. She was feeding her son. She's also feeding Elijah. Oh, it takes a miracle. I want you to understand that. She didn't get more. She got the same thing. That's how it looks like, how God takes care of you during the recession. Everybody gets laid off, you still stay in the same job. You don't get hike, you don't get promoted, you don't get no bonuses, you get the same salary, and it's less. God keeps you in the same job, but make sure you feed yourself, you feed your child. Same job, same money, nothing more, nothing less. Same thing, same little morsel of oil and flour. It's a miracle, you need to understand that. For the next seven years, there's no growth. But it's remain, that's how he knows how to feed you. What was supposed to be one meal for one child became a meal for that child, to her, and to the guest. Every day, all the days for the next seven years. Phenomenal, huh? this is this is how little sacrifices have repercussions. But that's not where the story ends. I'll tell how the story ends, and then I'll circle back to Rahab and close. Okay, listen. It's the second half of that story that that really is important for us to pay attention to. What happened after that is what I want to call adjacent possibility. But some of you are looking at me and saying, what did, what did you just say? If it sounds like Greek to you, don't worry about it. I just had to get out of my system. Adjacent possibility is something that took place because of one action that you, you did, which you did not even imagine. It's a result out of your act, one single act. That result you did not imagine, you did not anticipate, you did not even think it's possible. Here is, the, here is what happened there. After the famine finished, the son became sick. Right? The son became sick. And he became more sick. He became more sick, one day he died. She calls Elijah and says, did, did you bring a curse on us because we are sinners? This is seven years later after the famine. And Elijah brings this boy back to life. I have a theory here, okay? Listen to this very carefully. That theory is what I want to call adjacent possibility. This is a possibility you did not imagine. That Elijah was brought out of the cave to the city of Zarephath, the village of Zarephath, just to raise this kid from death. I think that's the possibility. She doesn't know it when she gave the flour and oil. She doesn't know it. She doesn't know her son is going to die seven years from now. He knew. She needs a man of God to be there to rise up the son from the death. But for that to happen, she needs to be willing to sacrifice. Selflessly. If God fed Elijah with ravens every single day, don't you think God can bring water back into the brook? 
Think of that possibility. He could have. I mean, God is capable of doing that. But God tells him, no, get up, go to Zerifat. Not to eat food, but one day, you being that, in that house would bring one child back to life. He thinks, think with me. If she did not selflessly sacrifice, Elijah wouldn't have stayed back. But because she selflessly sacrificed, even though it was difficult, Elijah stayed back. She had to feed him every day. But because she fed him every day, seven years from then, her child came back to life. Because of this problem. This uninvited guest. Unwanted guest. This unwanted guest brought son back to life. Your one act of selfless sacrifice will one day turn into a miracle. For yourself. For yourself. It's a possibility you can't even imagine. It's a... It's not something you can dream of. How many of us must be missing out on what God can do with our lives? Not just our lives, our children's lives and their families' lives and the generations to come? Simply because we are now unwilling to give to God? Unwilling to... You know it is the right thing to do. You know you must do. And yet you are pulling it back. And I don't blame you. But what if you just decided to let it go? That would be God setting you up for a miracle. That's what happened to Rahab. She opened the door. She set herself for a miracle. Do you know, I personally feel Rahab did a selfless sacrifice. Let me explain that and I'll close, okay? Because I can't send you away without this illustration. Rahab's business is she's a prostitute. Nobody wants to become a prostitute to make money. If somebody decides to become a prostitute, to sell her body, to make money, she must have had no other option. No other option. That's the only option she's got. So she becomes a harlot. The only way she can feed herself and her children, her entire family, is by letting somebody else use her body. Do you understand? That's our business. Now, I might sound sacrilegious right now to you, but forget that I'm a pastor right now. Just think with me. Think that I'm your friend and think with me. Okay, I'm just talking to you normally. Rahab's business is to sell her body, prostitution. That's the only way to survive. When she opened the door for the two spies to come and hide in her home, she shut down her business for the day. Do you understand what I'm saying? She becomes a prostitute because that's the only thing she can do. Uh, if she closes the business down, she doesn't have food. But she closes the food business down that day. Took, takes a risk. Now, I, I'm not con condoning the immoral behavior here. I'm just asking myself, what if I'm Rahab? It's a big sacrifice for me that day. It's a risk to hide these fellows. Not only, even if the, the, the city doesn't kill me for doing this, nobody will come back to my home again. I'm risking my business. I'm risking my profession. Risking my entire life along with me, my family and my children. What she did on that day, God watched it. Little things that we do, God watches them. Remember that. So not only he gets to save, not only we get to see Rahab being saved, her children getting saved, her extended family getting saved because of what she did on that day. It's just... You find her all the way back in Matthew chapter 1 being introduced as the mother of Jesus. Well, grandmother. Doesn't matter. Grandmother, great-grandmother, mother only, no? Mother of Jesus. A prostitute who shut down her business for one day got to become the mother of Jesus. 
our small minds know, we can't comprehend those things. So little we are as Christians in our mind. God is big. He sees people as they are. And he responds back to them as they respond to him. So forget about what others think. Do what God wants you to do. And do it today. You will set yourself up for a miracle. Let me pray with you. Whatever decision you need to make, whatever sacrifice you need to make, whatever risk you need to take, do it. Your life may be different from now. Will be different from now. And God will respect and respond to that. Thank you, Jesus. I want to pray with you. And then we have a little thing to do right after this. And then we'll close the service. Father, we want to thank you for today. Thank you for speaking to us. Giving us the privilege of watching you at work in um, uh, those who took baptism in the water today. It's a joy to see that happen, God. Thank you for giving us that privilege to be part of this. And God, we, pray, we praise you for speaking to us today. Your word is powerful. It speaks to us. And I know there are people here who need to make that defining decision. Whatever decision that they need to make, give them courage to make that decision. For those who need to take that calculated risk, Help them to seek your will first and then act on it. By faith, act on it. Help them to do that. This is crazy thing, God. So that they can experience this is awesome moment. And for those of us who need to offer that selfless sacrifice, you see that. Just like how you watch the video of Zerifat, just like how Mm, you saw Rahab and that little act of sacrifice. <laughs> you paid attention to it and you responded back miraculously and extravagantly. Amazing. Man, I can't even comprehend uh, the kind of kindness you show towards us, God. Would you please help us to do that? Anyone who's praying that prayer and saying, God, give me courage, give me faith. Give me willingness to offer. I pray that you would grant them. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would encourage us, enrich us to keep doing what you ask us to do so that we can keep experiencing what you can do. Bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen.